hopefully. Okay. We're going to move on now and we're going to talk about psychoses and uh, psychotic states and dissociative disorders and we'll see how far uh, we get today, hopefully, we'll get through this stuff. Um, I want to, um, I'm going to do time to time in the course, I'm going to give you some case studies and um, uh, I thought I would give you one to start off with which was somebody that I worked with when I was a psychologist at the mental hospital up in San Jose, California. I worked at Agnew State Hospital up there, which is the sister state hospital to Camarillo State Hospital here. Um, in fact, when I came here, I was having deja vu because the buildings, everything, the architecture exactly the same. They're all built at the same time, right? Uh, and I was a staff psychologist there, and I uh, started there, and um, I was given a patient, and he was almost always in six-point restraints tied down and um, didn't have any uh, medication, was not medicated when I first uh, met him. And he was the identified problem in the program that I uh, was in. And my boss tried to transfer him to another program, but nobody else would take him. And that was because he was a big person. He was probably over six feet, kind of big guy, um, scars all over, and years of hitting himself, and knocked his front teeth out. Um, uh, when he wasn't restrained, he'd hit himself severely on the head, face, and back of the neck. He also hit other people. He'd broken the bones of a couple nurses, broken one nurse's collarbone, hit another one in the head, head butted her, broke her eye socket. You know, I mean, pretty violent, dangerous guy. And everybody was really scared of him. And so I was the new guy, so this was my hazing ritual. <laughs> oh, you're the new guy. Hey, you know, we'll give him to you, right? So I got him as my patient. Um, he, had, he was in a wheelchair, he could only walk with, with a lot of difficulty, and it was either the result of a self-inflicted injury, or he had gone up and tried to hit somebody who was actually bigger and stronger than him, and the other person had hit him, and done some nerve damage on him. Um, uh, so he, was, he would spend all of his time in restraints in bed screaming, and then for, he'd be screaming like the top of his lungs, like, ah! You know, all day long, and then he just start like laughing, ah, you know, uncontrollably, and he's alternating back and forth. And then every time he'd look at you, and we look at you, sometimes you get a sense of like I would get a sense of like, wow, there's something really, it's really weird, something going on there. And I went to the unit physician, and I, I was telling her this, and she goes, she said to me, she goes, you know, if we lived back, back in the day, like in the 1500s or something, you know, we diagnosed as being demonically possessed. And I thought, man, yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense because he'd look at you and you'd, you'd look at you and you'd, you'd sense there was some other sort of like, even though he was nonverbal, his IQ was probably about like 15, right? He was nonverbal, but you had a sense of some intelligence behind the eyes. It was really, really weird and creepy. And so I always used him as a case because he was a good example of somebody who was diagnosed. He was diagnosed as being autistic and psychotic. They couldn't tell. They weren't sure. Either he was very severely autistic, or he was psychotic, or and or both. Because he was nonverbal, it was very difficult to distinguish. And I just screamed all day. It was very difficult to distinguish this. We didn't know if he was hallucinating or not. There was no way for us to really tell. And he was a very interesting person. You know, so this kind of guy is kind of demonically possessed. The the nurses who are mostly Filipino, Filipina, uh, who are just like the saints of the universe. I mean, these people should all be made into saints. The, greatest people, the most kindest people in the entire world, they were really scared of him. And, um, and they thought, you know, they wanted to stay away from him because, you know, they'd been getting hurt. So it's my job to deal with him. And, um, and interestingly enough, um, he was one of my big success stories working in There's not a lot of success stories you get working in a mental hospital. Uh, people don't, uh, these patients I had do not get better in the sense that they're going to become normal human beings. Uh, any improvement was huge and what happened with him is we looked back over his charts and we I did a lot of research on him to find out what people had tried with him before and you know found out that they uh, when they gave him psychiatric medication antipsychotic meditation medication he got better and they thought oh if a little bit is good a lot will be make him even more normal and so they gave him more and then he had sort of an adverse effect he had a cholinergic effect and so they um, so one thing we were able to do eventually was to get him on a slow dose of antipsychotic medication. And we also used a, a drug, uh, uh, that was sort of experimental at the time, that wasn't widely used, which was an SSRI, um, Zoloft, right, antidepressant. 
and we got him on Zoloft, and really within about it, and then, then but at that point, then we could start doing behaviorism with him. It wasn't really useful up until that point. Um, and then by the time I left the hospital, uh, he would be in his wheelchair sitting out with everybody else, unrestrained, and not hitting people, and being relatively speaking uh, somewhat happier, right? At least not being violent. And so I counted him as a really big success. I don't know if he was demonically possessed or not, but if he was, the demon was much happier. <laughs> didn't feel the need to hit people. Uh, but he was one of my big success stories. But he was somebody, I, I present this case because he's somebody who you know, had psychiatric diagnosis, either autism, severe autism, or psychosis, who you know, would have presented as you know, very typical of what you would see in people who are reported to have demonic possession. I'll, I'll show you a little video of some of that a little later on. And uh, he was very typical of that. If I'd made a video of him and showed it to anybody who was religious who believed in demonic possession, said, so what do you think of this? They would have said he's demonically possessed. Right? So again, the idea that you have to be able to do what we call a differential diagnosis between an actual psychiatric illness and a, a, a culturally mediated you know, kind of uh, uh, condition like demonic possession. You know, it's very important for mental health workers. So again, if you guys go on to grad school and you become a clinician, this is something that you may uh, need to do. You know, you, know you, you, need to, you need to rule out, is this guy psychotic? For and we assume that if the drugs work, that he's probably psychotic, right? We assume that, you know, if the, or maybe he's autistic, maybe some combination there. We assume that, but you know, you never know. You never know, and I'll get to that later at the end. Okay, okay. so let's talk about uh, psychosis first. Uh, these are serious mental disorders in which individuals lack an accurate perception or understanding of reality. They have little insight into how their behavior appears to others, and they typically have periods of hallucinations and delusions, right? Hallucinations can be visual. They can also be very com more commonly auditory voices talking to them, right? Um, it, psychosis, schizophrenia, uh, there's different um, psychotic illnesses. It used to be that these were thought of as somewhat separate, but to give the punchline away, we really now think of uh, all the psychotic spectrum illnesses as really being uh, on, a, on a spectrum of schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is the, the defining disorder, and we think of these other psychoses as variations of schizophrenia. Okay? So that's the new way of thinking, and that's reflected in the DSM-5 as opposed to the earlier DSMs. Okay? And uh, these schizophrenic uh, psychoses are marked by serious impairments in basic psychological functions, attention, perception, thought, emotions, and behaviors are all uh, affected. Okay? And it is not a dissociative identity disorder. It's not, people you say, oh, they're schizophrenic. No, they're, they used to think that they split personality, they have multiple personalities. Often gets mislabeled in the public as schizophrenia. That's not schizophrenia. That's dissociative identity disorder. So it's not multiple personalities. Schizophrenia is something different than that. Okay? So just so you know, because people will say, oh, you know, that, that person's on the street, you know, they're hearing voices, they must have multiple personality disorders. No, they're schizophrenic, it's different. Okay? Uh, other uh, history, uh, 1809, symptoms of schizophrenia first documented. Uh, Morell described the condition, he called it dementia praecox, and if you read the early Jungian and Freudian writings about this, they will use that term. Uh, and this means a premature loss of rational thought. In the late 1800s, a guy named Kreplin, who's very important, you'll learn about that guy in history and systems psychology, he identified dementia praecox as a major mental disorder with several subtypes. Early 1900s, Bleuler, who uh, uh, influenced Floyd, Freud, uh, renames the condition schizophrenia and broadens its definition. And it's thought of as a splitting of psychological functions. That's the early way of looking at it. Now we really look at it sort of differently than that. That's how they first thought about it. Okay, uh, Bueller in 1908 coins the term schizophrenia, and the four fundamental features uh, that he described are still uh, very important in looking at schizophrenia. Association, which is thought disorder, right? Affect, which is emotional disturbance, ambivalence, inability to make or follow through in decisions, and what they call at the time autism, not the same as autistic disorder that we think of now. Autism, uh, thinking of it, defining it as an idiosyncratic style of egocentric thought and behavior. Those are the four A's. Uh, schizophrenic symptoms, uh, it's a heterogeneous disorder, meaning it has lots of uh, ways of presenting in different people. 
Um, it's possible that it's not a single disorder, but now people are starting to think again just as uh, everything is a variation of this. Okay? There are positive and negative symptoms in schizophrenia. The positive symptoms are distortions of normal psychological functions that produce excess, excess behaviors. And the negative symptoms are dimin uh, diminished absence or loss of normal functions. Okay? So positive and negative symptoms. So when you see somebody out in the street in Ventura, downtown Ventura, and they're yelling at voices, and they're actively hearing something and hallucinating, they're responding to voice, what is that, positive or negative symptom? Positive. That's a positive symptom. If you see somebody out in the street in downtown LA, and they're sitting there, and they're just totally withdrawn, and like not paying attention to anything, and nothing, you know, people bump into them, they don't do anything, they're just, they're just zoned out, what's that? Negative. It's a negative, negative symptom. Okay. Uh, phases, three phase, prodromal, active, and residual. Prodromal is pre-schizophrenia, active is the active uh, thing, we used to call this a psychotic break, and the residual is the after effects, okay? And these all have certain, certain things, prodromal, you'll often, uh, people often, their associations will start loosening, they'll start making associations between things that don't seem really rational, like for instance, I'm having a cup of coffee, you know, but if I have this cup of coffee, that means it's going to stay sunny outside all day, right? And I have that belief, that really makes sense to me, right? But if I tell you that, you go, huh? That's a little weird, right? That, but maybe I'm starting to have more of those, that's in the prodromal phase. The active phase, I'll have lots more of that stuff, lots of looser associations, I might, I'll, I'll be hallucinating, I'll be hearing voices. And the residual phase, you know, I might have some sort of you know, maybe I can sort of hear the voices, you know, or maybe, you know, I still have some loose associations, um, you know, still sort of left over for sort of residual. Um, again, you can see disturbances in perception. This is the hallucinations. Thoughts, lack of cohesiveness and lo logic. This also has to do with the associations. Language, sometimes incomprehensible. Uh, and actions that are odd and disturbing. Behaviors odd and disturbing. Okay. Again, positive symptoms include um, uh, delusions, delusions of persecution, delusions of reference, delusions of control, delusions of grandeur. These are all things that people will, will, will uh, be related to a schizophrenic person's behavior. Okay. Um, hallucinations, auditory, visual, sometimes somatic, sometimes uh, uh, taste and smell, they can hallucinate taste and smell. Um, disordered thought processes, and this is usually shown by speech, derailment, cognitive slippage, loosening of associations, neologisms, perseveration, clang association, you know what clanging is? I had a patient who did this, clang. You clang because you bang, because you wang, because you jang, you nang, you clang, and just go on and on and rhyming, right? It's just like, it's like, it's like, it's like dissociative rapping. You know, just <laughs> go on and just make up all these kind of weird things uh, without any logic to it, just clang. I, I cut a guy who did that, it was really interesting. Uh, Neologibs is making up new words. Um, Uh, disordered behavior, you know, disorganized behavior, you know, running around doing things without really any rhyme or reason. Um, and then catatonia, they're putting as a positive symptom, but catatonia, it can also be a negative symptom. Catatonia is where somebody goes into a so-called catatonic state and they just freeze. Like I just do this and I freeze. And you come over and you push me, you try to move me. I don't do it, I just sit here like weird, some weird posture, I just freeze in this posture. Right, I might do that way for days, right? Uh, I had catatonic patients um, before, and it's really interesting. They really don't move. They just sit there, and if you move, sometimes they'll resist moving, and other times you'll move them and then they'll move back. Um, you'll see lots of different versions of it. I always thought of catatonia as sort of a negative symptom, but they're saying it's positive here, so we'll go with that. Um, negative symptoms. Uh, diminished uh, affect, diminished abolition, you know what abolition is, not having any motivation to do anything. 
Uh, elogia is not speaking. Asociality is not interacting with the people. Anhedonia is not having any pleasure. Okay. Um, and again, you can read the DSM stuff. This is mostly the stuff I just told you. Age of onset rarely, rarely develops before age 15. Uh, but there is childhood schizophrenia, and that also, you know, it's, it's fairly rare, but it does happen. Um, there may be a relationship between onset of schizophrenia triggering the first psychotic break and uh, pot smoking, heavy pot smoking. This is why we don't want kids to smoke pot when they're small, younger. Um, we're not quite sure it's a chicken and egg question. We don't know if it's pot smoking causes brain damage that could lead to schizophrenia, or whether somebody who incipiently has schizophrenia is going to have it self-medicates by smoking pot. The jury, as far as I know, is still out, even though there is now some strong evidence that pot smoking for people whose brains are developing can lead to uh, brain damage. This is for heavy pot smokers. I'm talking like real heavy duty stoners, right? Um, so if you are, uh, you know, younger and you are smoking lots of pot it is really like playing Russian roulette you know maybe it does nothing to you I mean I grew up with people who smoke pot all the time and you know some of them now are nuclear engineers you know they, they obviously were okay uh, and I know other people who eh, you know I'm not quite sure about that person right and you probably all know somebody like that but it's a little bit of a crapshoot the younger you are the worse that's what the research is showing out young kids smoking pot is much bigger risk your guy's age, still some risk. 20, still some risk. You hit 30, 35, you know, actually you're fine. So I'm probably not going to do anything. To you. <laughs> when you get my age, actually the research is showing it may be good for your cognitive function, believe it or not, <coughs> for older people. So again, this is something, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about smoking pot, um, just know that there is some evidence that, uh, that you know, uh, you know you, if your brain's still developing, that it can be some problematic. Okay? Um, again, a lot more research needs to be done on this. And luckily for us is that there's wonderful natural experiments going on everywhere now that pot's being legalized. So pot's being legalized, it's not in being, you don't have to be 30 to, to smoke pot legally. You can be, what, 18 or 21? I guess it's 21, right? 21 to smoke pot legally now. Well, guess what? That's going to be a great natural experiment. I think there'll be lots of doctoral dissertations based on what's happening in people, you know, looking out people and look how much people are smoking, what they're doing, all sorts of things. So a great chance to do a doctoral dissertation. And it'll be, it'll be a lot of attention for it. It'll be very, very good for your career. So, uh, you know, and by the time you're ready to do your doctorate and write your dissertation, there'll be lots of data out there. All right? So that's coming down the pike now. Yes? With genetics, can you have like the genes and don't develop the schizophrenia disorder at all? Yeah, so you can have the so there is a there is a genetic component to schizophrenia, and I, I should have had that on the slide. I sorry, I didn't do uh, I didn't put that in the slide. Um, what's the, the genetic? It's about so we know like twins. They've done twin studies, and they know if one twin has schizophrenia that the other one is, I think, 60% likely. So there is, a, there is a strong genetic component. It's not a simple genetic component. It's not like one gene they found. I think the last thing I looked at was like 11 possible different genes that could be contributing to it. So it's not a simple relationship, but there is a genetic component to it. Um, if you have a first degree relative that's got schizophrenia, that is a good reason not to smoke pot when you're young. Because you now now you're playing Russian roulette and you put another bullet in the revolver, right? <laughs> you know I mean? Now you're really taking a chance, right? So if you have a first degree relative who's, who's schizophrenic, you really should not smoke pot. Find another something else, you know, pick some mushrooms or something. I don't know, something else that will not trigger your schizophrenia. Okay, you know, but uh, but you, yeah, there is there's definitely a genetic component to it, but genetic is not everything. Right, so the, we also know there's environmental stuff as well. So maybe people have a dispos predisposition to it, and then there's a trigger, right? So that's one of the thoughts, and the triggers have been thought to be all sorts of things from uh, various viruses to environmental things, and uh, the virus um, uh, theory is, I believe, still uh, alive and well, and people are still researching that, that there may be some virus that does something in the brain, and that's, you know. So there's, there's a lot of really interesting things. I'll talk later on about 
Toxoplasmosis, that's another one. Toxoplasmosis infection thought to be maybe related to schizophrenia. And there's some good data on that. So again, it's not, but probably not a simple relationship. It's probably a complicated relationship. Can you say someone that has genetic components and does drugs has like a really high risk to develop? Well, I don't know about all drugs. We know now pot is the one that seems to be related to at least triggering the psychotic uh, episodes for kids, you know, you younger know people. Like methamphetamine, or methamphetamine can induce a, it can induce, it can induce a psychotic state, but usually when the meth wears off, the person stops being psychotic. But it can cause brain damage too if you do enough of it. Yeah, yeah, meth would be the other one that you want to be really careful about. Right? You shouldn't do meth anyway. Right? <laughs> Meth's a bad drug. It's not good. It's really bad for you. So you don't want to do meth anyway. So don't do meth. You know. Pot's legal, so you know whether you want to do it or not. That's up to you. You know, but yeah, don't do math. <laughs> yes, question. Is there something uh, in pot that I guess creates or causes predisposition to you know manifest, whereas versus like uh, like a hallucinogenic? You know, yeah, I am not. I'm not the person to ask about the details of that. There is, there, there have been now, they've been theorizing the mechanisms by which it causes, it affects part of the brain, there's an effect on the part of the brain, um, but it's different than other, I mean, there's no evidence that I know that hallucinogenic drugs like mushrooms or LSD or anything, um, you know, trigger a permanent psychotic state. Now, if you are incipiently going to be psychotic, you're going to have a psychotic break and you do some drugs, maybe it unbalances your brain enough to knock you into that state. That's possible, but I don't know that that's, that's, um, that's, I haven't seen research on that. You know, the pot is the one that is the really big thing. You know, the, the other, the, the hallucinogenic drugs, I mean, again, I'm not advocating people to go out and take these things, but <laughs> they tend to be very safe, yeah, no, you no, know. I Yeah, that I don't know about. That I don't know about. I do know there's research on mushrooms now showing it has a positive effect on people's mm -hmm. psychology. Psilocybin. And psilocybin, yeah. There's, 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 um, there's some research, decent research. People are doing more research on that now. They're actually being allowed to do it more. So there's some of that coming out there now. Does that mean they're going to legalize mushrooms? I don't. There's some place was trying to do that recently, Oregon or someplace. Um, but again, you know, you know. Uh, but the safety record for hallucinogens is fairly safe. I mean, I mean, if you're comparing, I mean, you know the big, the bad ones, right? Yeah. Alcohol yeah. and tobacco. Yeah. That kills more people than anything, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, those are the bad ones, right? The legal ones, right? Alcohol and tobacco are the ones that are really bad. You know, those are the ones that kill people. And there's real lot of mortality, morbidity from those two, right? Um, you know, and now pot, we'll find out, we're going to find out what to yeah. deal with pot is probably not as bad. Right. But pot's also bad for your lungs. It burns very hot. I mean, there's all sorts of things, you know. So again, <laughs> you write your doctoral dissertation on this, right? You can go look at this and compare the things, you know. Yes. It sounds to me like it's kind of a diathesis stress kind of like model fit. Yeah, it, exactly. It yeah, diathesis stress. stress. Yeah. Or it could be. Yes. Whether or not it's confirmed yet, but like it could be the diathesis yes. stressor. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. Yes. Yes. Very complicated. So environment and and genetic predisposition all kind of coming together, right? But again, if you have first degree relatives, um, that is, you know, you got a twin brother or sister who's schizophrenic, you know, you, you got a parent who's schizophrenic, you know, probably best to stay away. At least until you're 30, 35, then it won't make a difference. When you're my age, smoke away, right? <laughs> of course, people my age have already been smoking most of their life, so, you know, it's, I don't smoke pot, so, you know, for me, it was never, never something that was very enjoyable. So you're, you're not gonna go to the Zappa concert over in Westlake. I might go to Dweezil Zappa concert. But, you know, Frank Zappa was very against drugs. No, I know. And, and my, my, uh, my cousins actually grew up, at, they were friends with Dweezil and Moon Unit. And they found that, and, and, and Frank was very strict about his kids not using drugs. My dad was in a band. Yeah. yeah. So, they, 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 as far as I know, they're not, they're not pot smokers. Maybe now. You know. All right, we're getting off track here. Okay. Um, so it's good for age onset rel relatively rarely before 15. Peak is usually about 25. Can develop in anybody though. You can develop it in your 50s and 60s. Um, so you can really get it any time. 
Okay, but usually it's in young, young adulthood. Uh, prevalence, about 51 million people worldwide, about 1% prevalence rate. And the rates are stable across culture, gender, religion, geographic region. Uh, this also tends to make you think that there's something genetically going on there. Okay? Uh, prevalence rates are higher among people who migrate. Uh, so if you are immigrating from one country to the other, you're at higher risk of schizophrenia. So if, you're, if your mom is schizophrenic, you're immigrating to a country, you know, and somebody offers you a joint, don't take it, right? <laughs> See, that's worse. So, yeah, but, you know, but immigration is very stressful, right? You know, many of you probably have parents who immigrated, right? Anybody here have a first, first generation American? Uh, I am. My dad immigrated here, right? So, you know, um, you know it's stressful. Immigration is stressful, okay? Um, and that's probably what's going on there. It, again, when people are put under stress, the diet thesis stress model, you put under stress, you trigger things, right? Uh, prognosis for, is poor for people living in more developed nations. What? That's not right. Wait a minute, developed nations, we have all this great first world medicine here, you know, we should have, no. Actually, the prognosis is better for people in poor non-developed nations. If you are in uh, some small third world country and you have a psychotic break and you go to the doctor, typically what they'll do is say, it will send you home. And, you know, you have your, you have your family, your extended family will be there and everybody will just sort of help you get through it. And then you are 70% likely not to have another psychotic break. Okay? This is what the research shows. In a developed country, you have a schizophrenic symptom, they take you to the hospital in Ventura. What's the first thing they're going to do? No, they're going to shoot you up full of an antipsychotic drug. Okay, Haldol, Thorazine, whatever the new one is, right? And in, in developed countries where they do that, what they found is that you are now 70% more likely to have a, another psychotic break. And so this, this is a very controversial thing that people are looking into now, but one of, the, one of the suspects is the drugs, the antipsychotic drugs, may affect the brain to the point where it makes the sort of bar to entry for the psychotic break to, have to, to be lower. So it's easier for you to have another psychotic break. And that's being researched now. It gets very controversial. But that's being researched now, and we're really looking into that. Because people in poorer countries don't seem to have as many subsequent psychotic breaks as people in richer countries. And that's the, see the difference is getting the drug at first psychotic episode. So that's something, again, that really deserves more study. Yes? Um, have they found that any of, these, that any of the underdeveloped nations where that happens, or are, are, are those more collectivist? Or like, did you happen to know if they were more collectivist? I think the idea is that there's more family support. But there's been some studies. I have the I have the studies somewhere. If you remind me, I'll I can pull them out for you. Yeah, it's very interesting. Okay, individual schizophrenia have increased morbidity, and mortality, and again, if you go up to Ventura and look at people living on the street, that will make sense to you because they're not living in really good conditions, right? And they're not taking care of themselves. They're not eating properly. A lot of people with schizophrenia smoke. Uh, the idea is that nicotine is a self-medicating thing, makes them feel better to have nicotine. Nicotine affects some of the same receptors in the brain and it can make them feel better. Okay? So you'll see schiz most schizophrenic people, if you work in a hospital, most schizophrenic patients, and when I worked in the hospital, smoked cigarettes. And it was very cruel to take the cigarettes away. If you really needed to get them to do something, you could, you could withhold the cigarettes and get them to do stuff. It was a very cruel thing because it actually really, they would say it would make them feel better. Males tend to be diagnosed earlier. Women tend to have a better prognosis. Okay. All right, different types, variations of, well, now we're thinking this is very, all these psychoses are variations on the theme of schizophrenia. So we can talk about schizotypal personality disorder, which we talked about last time, which is sort of like schizophrenia light, or maybe the person's degree becomes schizophrenic. We can talk about delusional disorder, which is uh, basically the person has delusions but no other psychotic symptoms. We talk about brief psychotic disorder, which lasts more than a day but remits by one month. And a lot of times people who are schizophrenic, they'll get initial diagnosis of brief psychotic disorder. If it lasts longer than a month, then it will be changed to schizophrenia. Schizophreniform disorder, again, is a little like schizotypal personality disorder. A person has a sort of a, um, they, 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 have, they present like schizophrenia or schizophrenia light, but it's less than six months. Okay? And, um, and they don't have a decline so much in functioning. They still are able to function. 
So again, it's sort of like proto schizophrenia. It might be, I don't know, I should probably find this out. It's probably a little like, a little beyond the prodromal phase, maybe in between prodromal and active schizophrenia. Schizophrenia uh, episode lasts at least six months and includes one month of active phase symptoms. Uh, sorry, there's, there should be another line uh, there. Schizoaffective disorder is a mood episode uh, and active phase symptoms of schizophrenia occur together. So this is something that is like bipolar disorder. You know, people have bipolar disorder, when they're really manic, they become very, they can become quite delusional, right? And so if you see somebody with that, what is the main thing they have? Are they really delusional and schizophrenic, but then they also have mood swings, or they have these great big mood swings, and then, they're, and then they also have on top of that, you know, sort of psychotic symptoms, right? So again, as a clinician, you have to see which one is sort of predominant give a diagnosis. If the, if the mood swings are predominant, you give them bipolar, as a bipolar 2. And if, 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 the, if the schizophrenic disorders are prominent, you give them, um, you give them a, a schizoaffective disorder. So it, it'll just depend. And sometimes it'll depend on what you're going to get paid for more, right? Because um, sometimes it's hard to distinguish between the two. Okay? Or what you're seeing when you go in and, and interview the person. You maybe you're really catching them at the top, psychotic, off their rocker, and you're going to give them schizoaffective, right? But if you look at their chart, you go, oh, they've been bouncing up and down, manic depressive. Okay, you know, maybe I'll give them manic depressive. So again, it, sometimes it's like really difficult to tell the difference. Um, you can have a substance medication induced psychotic disorder. Here's your meth, right? You take enough meth, you can start acting psychotic. You take PCP, you can act psychotic. There's a number of substances that induce a psychotic state, usually when the substance is out of the body, uh, the person will no longer be psychotic. Okay? There can be a psychotic disorder due to another medical condition. You can have some sort of medical condition to have some, something you know, affect your brain, you can become psychotic. Okay? Uh, you can have, for instance, you can have catatonia, you know, that sort of stuckness uh, can occur in several disorders, including neurodevelopmental, uh, bipolar, depressive, other mental disorders is, uh, can go along with that. Uh, you can have cat catatonic sort of due to some other medical condition. You can have unspecified catatonia. Um, and then you always have uh, these sort of, sort of uh, uh, catch-all diagnoses, uh, other unspecified, unspecified schizophrenia. This is if, you know, you think the person's psychotic, they've got some symptoms, but I really want to, you know, wait and see before I make a definitive diagnosis, you give them that one, okay? Okay. Um, Okay, this is just saying they're all variations of schizophrenia. Yeah. Now, a couple types of schizophrenia you should know about. Paranoid schizophrenia. This is the one that's the most dangerous. If you're going to working with uh, schizophrenic individuals, you're going to get hit. You know, or you're going to get some violence done to you. It's more likely going to be a paranoid schizophrenic. Uh, how do I know this? I found out the hard way. Uh, I was working at the mental hospital my first week, and um, my colleagues said to me, oh, there's a little lady, her name was Bernice. They said, oh, you take Bernice to her room. Bernice was like, in her, like 80 years old, right? She's about this tall, maybe 90 pounds soaking wet. And oh, I'll take Bernice. Oh, she's a sweet a little old lady, you know, she's here. I, th I figured, oh, she's got some dementia, that's why she's here, right? So I'm escorting her to her room, I take her to her room, I unlock, you know, I'm going through the thing, I unlock the doors, go through, take her, open her door up for her room, and as I'm opening up, I see out this corner of my eye, this fist coming at me. And I go on the ground, I fall on the ground, I'm seeing like stars, you know, and all 80, 90 pounds of her were behind that fist, <laughs> and she just, and then my colleagues were there just laughing, rolling on the ground, laughing, they pranked me, right, they knew she was like paranoid, she was paranoid schizophrenic, I didn't know that, and so she thought I was trying to kill her, right, she's a delusion, she didn't say anything, she, take her in the room to kill her, that was her delusion, right, so she just winged me, and I was on the floor laughing, you know, they were laughing, you know, so I learned the hard way, you know. Um, uh, so paranoid people are the ones who are, if, if, most schizophrenic people are not dangerous, but the dangerous ones are going to be the ones who are paranoid. You've got to be a little careful about that. You know? And there's lots of examples, but I think for the sake of time, I'm going to avoid the examples. I think we're getting, maybe take a little break. You guys want to take a little break? Let's take a little break. Oh, before we do the break, let us do roll. Let's take roll, okay? Middle of the class. All right. So let's move on. Uh, from paranoia, and um, I'll just point out there's a great example of this um, in this movie. The, I want to show you this. This is an interesting guy. This is a schizophrenic guy. But I don't have to obey and do everything they say. He's talking about the voices. When you say they, uh, what exactly do you, do you see? 
demons. Even though, in here, as we speak, yes. Well, right there, right behind you. Right behind me. Does he uh, say anything? Yes. What does he say? He tells me to hurt you. He wants me to hit you. He wants me to cut you. So just to give you a little sense of, he's really paranoid, but again, you know, a lot of times the voices are very persecutory and they will tell somebody that, you know, this guy's bad, you should, you know, kill them or do something. So that is relatively common. Um, another good example of parents get screen is from this movie. I won't play this whole thing. I tried to run a sit properly with a book, but they frightened me at every turn. The fool wanted to walk around. This is from Humphrey Bogart, this movie called The Cane Mutiny where he is Captain Bly and he starts thinking that all the officers and the men on the ship are like trying to get him and fool him and stuff and he goes crazy and they have the trial at the end and this is what this is from. It's a very it's a good movie, uh, excellent movie if you want something good to watch. I won't, I won't play the little thing, just mention that to you. Okay, all right. Uh, brief reactive psychosis, uh, sudden short display of psychotic behavior. Um, remember Brittany Spears, your neighbor down in Calabasas? Remember she went nuts and she cut off all her hair and went on some kind of little spree around? Um, that, maybe that was a brief reactive psychosis. I don't know. People say she, people tend to report that she's a little nutty, but I don't know her. Uh, but, you know, that could possibly have been something like that, right? Who knows? Shared psychotic disorder. This is one of my favorites. This is called, used to be called uh, folie adieu. And I think you guys have a reading on this. And this is a really interesting one. This is where a person with schizophrenia is in close contact and somewhat usually isolated with a person without schizophrenia. And um, they will, uh, the person without schizophrenia will then adopt the beliefs and the delusions of the schizophrenic person. And there's lots of cases. Usually it's a family member, like a mother and a daughter, or you know, two brother and a sister, or um, you know. And usually they're isolated somewhere. And, and what they do is when they find them and they actually split them apart, the non-schizophrenic person will go back and be, start being normal. As the schizophrenic person will maintain the delusion, the non-schizophrenic person will, 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 will lose the delusions, right? And so this is, there, you know, again, this is a really interesting phenomenon. It goes back to one of the themes of the class, the theme of the class, which is how easy it is to brainwash people how gullible we are. And why are we so gullible and brainwashable? Because there was survival value to that when, in our primate ancestors. We've inherited that. We tend to go along with whatever the, you know, the alpha member of the group believes, even if that stuff is really delusional. And again, you only have to look toward politics in America and anywhere else in the world to see how true this is, right? So we can have you know, the case where you really have a really overtly, floridly psychotic person and a person close to them who, share, who then ends up adopting their beliefs like a mother and a child, or you can have uh, you know, a nation where you have a leader who says certain things and like large groups of people believe that even when there's evidence to the contrary, right? And again, a good example might be America right now. Um, another good example, of course, I bring this up in the other classes, Nazi Germany. Uh, you have sort of these mass delusions, and I'll talk a little more about that later. Uh, you also have small, you know, you, all, you also have versions of this where, the, and again, the, the mass delusions, the person Who's you know the leaders are not necessarily psychotic, right? They may just have some sort of delusional state that's not realistic. They may not be fully psychotic, and so you have people who. So again, this ranges from people who are floridly psychotic who influence others close to them to small groups to large groups. Maybe the small and large groups of people aren't completely psychotic. You know, they just have some delusions, right? That makes sense. And so one and there's and you guys have done the reading on this yet? You read this? I think I gave you a case on this. Really interesting. Um, one example I like to use is from the martial arts. Martial arts, there's lots of delusional thinking about people. Uh, people have. And um, I thought I'd show you this as an example of this folie adieu. Even though the guy is not psychotic, 
you can decide with yourself whether you think he's delusional. This is from a Japanese game show, and by the way, Japanese game shows are awesome. And there's so much weird stuff that they do, it's just great. I wish American game shows were half as fun. Um, but now what they're doing is they're going to they're gonna show a film of a guy who's called the Ki Master. Ki is the internal energy that you can develop. This guy is a Ki Ki Master. There he is. He's just waving his hands and knocking these people away, right? これ、あの、今あの、外国人の方が、お姉さんが通りましたね。これちょっと、あの、脇腹を痛めちゃうんですよ。ね、ほら、出て出て出て出て。またこの感情を詰め込んで、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、
I must have said something about his mother or something, I don't know. <laughs> he didn't really beat him down there. So there you go. Well, in my mind, this is a... Look at how he's running over, he feels bad. He <laughs> beat that poor old guy down. Call the doctor. All right, so um, again, this is the delusional... Uh, you know, again, I think this is like a Foley, I do. Again, the guy's not psychotic. But he's delusional, and sometimes you're, you know this happens with teachers. You get around, with, you know, only around your own students. They want to please you unconsciously, so they don't actually challenge you. And then you start believing you have some sort of magical power. And this is really common in martial arts, unfortunately. And you can go on the internet; you can find lots of examples of stuff like this. Um, and this is another version of sort of you can think of it as mass hypnosis, mass, you know, hallucination, or you can think of it as fully I do. Uh, but it's an example. So it's not, that guy, again, I'm going to make a point, that guy was not psychotic. <laughs> but it's like, a, there's a spectrum, right? From the full-on psychotic all the way to people just fooling themselves, right? <coughs> all right. All right, let's move on to dissociative disorders. Any questions about psychoses? That's our little, quick little tour through psychoses. Any, any questions about, um, about psychoses? Okay. Let's go through dissociative disorders really quick. Um, and I have a case study here, which we're going to run out of time, so I don't think I really want to go into it. I'll let you guys read this. This is about a woman that I um, saw uh, not as a psychologist, like a clinician, but as a, as a professor. I was teaching in an institution, and this woman came needing help with her dissertation. And long story short, she would, um, she would come in and present very differently depending on, like, you know, what state of mind she was in. And I kind of, and it was interestingly enough, she was writing her dissertation on people with dissociative identity disorder. That was, she was a therapist, a master's level therapist, trying to finish her PhD and uh, treating DID was her specialty. And it became very clear to me after seeing her a couple times, I think she actually has DID, right? Um, this is a very rare disorder. Most clinicians are not going to see a case of dissociative identity disorder in their practice in their lifetime. I never saw a case of dissociative identity disorder. The closest thing I saw was people with borderline, severe borderline personality disorder. I never saw a full-on case of multiple personalities, dissociative identity disorder, as a clinician. But as a professor, I had this lady, and I was pretty certain by the time I was done with her that she had dissociative identity disorder. So that's my little case study here. I'll let you read that. And I put this picture up. This was from that show, remember Heroes? And this woman would go, she had an alter ego. She would let her alter ego would take over and she would be totally badass and beat the crap out of people. Um, so I put her picture up there. Everybody's forgotten that show now. I should probably get, get a different picture. All right. Nature of dissociation. Normally integrated elements of consciousness, memory, and personal identity become splintered, may impair memory. Uh, it has potential for identity confusion, feeling surrounding objects are not real, and there can be emotional detachment. These are the main uh, kind of characteristics. Symptoms of dissociative disorder can include amnesia, depersonalization, feeling like you know, you're not really you anymore, derealization, feeling like you're separate from reality, identity confusion, and identity alteration. Four major dissociative disorder, dissociative amnesia, Dissociative identity disorder, this used to be called multiple personality disorder, depersonalization, derealization disorder, and other unspecified disorders. Okay? Symptoms common to all of them are memory loss, amnesia of certain time periods, events, and people, mental health problems, uh, other mental health problems, including depression and anxiety, sense of being detached from yourself, depersonalization, a perception of people and things around you is distorted or unreal, it's derealization, and a blurred sense of identity. Dissociative amnesia, memory loss, it's more extensive than normal forgetfulness, can't be explained by a physical or neurological condition. But it does sometimes occur after a traumatic event like a car accident or something. Um, dissociative fugue, this is a really interesting one. People with this dissociate them uh, by putting real distance between themselves and their previous identity. And these are people who like, have amnesia. They'll end up like thousands of miles away and they'll say, who are you? Like, I don't know why, I forgot who I am. And they'll, but they'll go long distances away and, um, uh, and they won't know who they are. And it can last a few hours or it can last months, in some cases even years. 
And it didn't end abruptly. The person will just suddenly remember who they are. And what am I doing here in Alaska? You know, oh, well, you know, you've been here the last six months. What? You know? And so that's very interesting. Uh, and there's interesting cases of this there. Depersonalization, derealization, uh, sense of being outside yourself, viewing your actus, actions from a distance, like you're watching your life as, like it's a movie. Be accompanied by perceived distortion of the size and shape of your body and or of other people and objects around you. Um, time may seem to slow down, the world may seem unreal, symptoms may last a few moments or they may wax and wane over many years. Now the one that we're most interested in is dissociative identity disorder, it used to be known multiple, as multiple personality disorder. It's characterized by switching to different alternate identities when you're under stress. Okay? And, they, and the person may feel the presence of one or more people talking or living inside their own head. Uh, each of these identities may have their own name, personal history, characteristics, including marked differences in manner, voice, gender, and even physical qualities, like the need to wear glasses. Okay? Often considerable variation in each alternate personality's familiarity with the others. Some, are re some know there's other personalities, some do not. Um, and then, so they can have some dissociative amnesia with it. You know, they can snap one identity and not remember that they were in the other because they don't, one identity may not know about the last one they were in. And it's an interesting uh, website of an artist who has uh, DID. And I think I don't have it on here, so I'll skip that for now. Okay. Now, how do we understand DID? And the, 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 the latest sort of, uh, in my opinion, the best thinking about it is, it can be understood as a coping mechanism for dealing with severe and continuous childhood trauma or abuse, right? Um, many severe disorders, including some of the personality disorders I talked about, um, child abuse can happen, it can be severe and continuous, but the kid might have some sort of a safe refuge. There's some place they can go from time to time and escape the abuse and have some refuge from it for, for a period of time, okay? And those kids may just develop one of your personality disorders, borderline personality disorder or antisocial personality disorder, something like that, right? But for DID, the thought is, is that this kid is undergoing this kind of abuse but has no safe refuge. There's no place they can go to feel safe at all. And so what they end up doing is they end up dissociating from the trauma mentally. And again, it also probably, there's probably some component to it where they have a talent or some predisposition where they're able to dissociate. But dissociation is like a muscle, it's like going to the gym. You got, you're able to do it a little bit, but you practice it over time, you're starting able to do it better and better and better. And the idea here is that these kids will then start to dissociate, they'll start getting good at it, they'll dissociate, and they'll dissociate, and then when they're dissociated, they'll start to develop different personalities, right? And so again, they're able to dissociate from, these pers uh, from, their, from the state where they're being abused, and, and develop these different personalities. And rather than do normal development where you develop one personality, now in development they develop multiple personalities, right? And they switch back and forth depending on what's going on. So they're in one personality, they experience some stress, and they're, they, they've now habituated their way of dealing with stress is to switch personalities. And so now they'll switch personalities, you know, throughout the day, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe a period of day, maybe a period of weeks. Um, Typically, they'll have a lot of personalities. They can have 50, 100 sometimes. Usually, they have, I think, 10, 10 or 15. I can't remember what the number was. Maybe I have it later on here, okay? Um, that's the idea for this, the, I think the best theory that I've heard. Um, okay. And again, if you think about the ability to associate as evolutionarily valuable, you know, if you were uh, living in war, you know, in some traumatic environment, which a lot of human history, humans, hominids, lived in very traumatic environments. You know, the ability to dissociate, you know, could have been really had a little bit of survival value, you know. Um, you know, so that might be, might, might be why we have the ability to do this at all, okay. Um, I'm not going to play that for you. Um, so dissociative identity disorder, again, is very rare. I mean, the prevalence, I believe, is so small that they really can't really measure it. Uh, and you really have to be careful about uh, uh, if somebody comes in with symptoms of dissociative identity disorder really differentially diagnosing, because again, it could be something that people could fake pretty easily. And so you really want to be clear about that. Usually there's uh, the different personalities are called alters. And there's usually some different ones. There's usually one that's a main one. There's usually one that's depressed. Oftentimes there's one that's a child. A lot of times the child is the uh, abused child. 
And so you can see, um, you can see uh, a lot of these kind of similarities across cases. Yes? So did the disorder actually exist? Because I have heard yeah. before that it Yeah, wasn't. they think it exists. It's very rare. Um, I can show you, let me show you a... So this woman, Kim Noble, is an artist who suffers from dissociative identity disorder. And um, her, each of her, a lot of her altars are artists. And you can see her stuff here. It's very interesting. If you go to her website here, you can go to the galleries and you can see her work. She says our work of the different of the different um, altars, right? So this is one altar, right? This painting style. This other altar, very different style. This one very different, really different. And you start seeing, and then some of the altars here, you get down, you start seeing the ones that maybe are the kid that gets abused, right? Some down here, they become very disturbing after, you know, some of these become very, very disturbing. Here's one, you know, the kid being tortured and raped and things like that, you know, they become more and more disturbing. So she has like 14, I think there's 14 uh, altars. So you go check out this website. But it, so it's very rare. And there's people who specialize in this. And you have to really be able to, and treating it, treating it, the idea is you try to integrate the altars together. And that's how the treatment goes. You get the altars to recognize each other and you, and you work toward integrating those identities. And it takes a long time and there's people who specialize in it. Um, but yeah, there, there are people who believe it's real. Um, there's some people who believe it's not real. Some people, but there are people who believe it's real and, and work with it. And again, there's some cases like this that are pretty well documented. So check out the website. I encourage you to go and check that. It's really interesting. You can read about her and stuff. It's really quite fascinating. Question? Yeah. Class, yeah. People are faking. It's a good. It's an easy thing to fake. So I want to get attention, whatever reason. You know, um, I can I can do this and I can fake having different personalities. Um, you know, that's my understanding. There's a guy named Spanos. I think I gave you guys an article. Uh, Spanos wrote a whole book on this, and, and he really emphasizes a lot the need to, for differential diagnosis. You really got to be really careful in the diagnosis of this. Um, you know, that's the, I'd say, but probably, my feeling is it probably exists, it's probably very rare. And it probably, because the reason I say that is because dissociation is something, we see dissociation in borderline personality disorder, and if you were looking at, at these disorders not from the DSM, but looking at it psychoanalytically, you would say that dissociative identity disorder is like just worst borderline. Borderline is the mild dissociation, the DID is the really intense dissociation. So it's a spectrum, right, from dissociation. So you can look at these, you, you, you know, I would put borderline personality disorder in, in with dissociative disorders, you know, mild dissociative disorder, because this is, DID is the, sort of the, the, the characterization of that. And we certainly see dissociation a lot with people with borderline personality disorder. So I think, it, I think my personal feeling, I think it exists. I do think it's probably very, very rare. Okay. And what are our cultural perspectives on this? Um, beliefs in possession, okay? All these kind of things of people who have demonic possession, um, speaking in tongues, all these kind of things. Attack it in nervios, we're gonna talk about that later on. That also could be something that, you know, in, in certain cultures is, a uh, could be related to dissociation. Uh, there's dissociation during religious and medical rituals, you know, medical procedures and religious things. We know about this. We know about shamanically induced trance states where there's dissociation. So we know that dissociative behavior is part of the human repertoire. We definitely see, you know, humans have, they can, in certain circumstances, can dissociate. So to my mind, you know, that makes, you know, the existence of DID at least plausible. You know, at least plausible. But again, most people who are clinicians are not going to see cases of DID. Okay. All right.